Lecture 6, Chartism. Today we're going to go through some of the key facts related to the largest movement for democracy in 19th century Britain. It's a huge topic and we won't be able to cover everything in sufficient detail or nuance, so I recommend you read Malcolm Chase's book, Chartism, A New History, to get the full details and overview. Um, but I'm going to point out some of the things that you'll need to know for the workshop. So where did Chartism come from? We start with the 1832 Reform Act. So as we've seen in previous workshops, the parliamentary reform movements that emerged from the French Revolution onwards in Britain um, were campaigning for some measure of parliamentary reform, some measure of extended franchise. There were large working class groups who were campaigning for democracy for all men and various other um, parliamentary reforms. But the ultimate outcome was, to some extent, a damp squib, um, whereas this cartoon shows it as a, as a big firework going off. Um, the 1832 Reform Act was eventually passed by a Whig government to dampen down campaign for reform. And it gave a somewhat limited extended franchise to anyone who had £10 worth of property and um, reorganised the parliamentary system so some of those big industrial cities um, that didn't have parliamentary representation now got them whereas some of the small villages that had got MPs through um, legacy and history um, were um, de disenfranchised. So it was a significant measure in terms of changing the parliamentary system, but it wasn't a huge um, victory for, dem for democracy by any means. So um, some of the middle classes and a large number of the working classes who had previously campaigned for the vote were very dissatisfied with the 1832 Reform Act. The other measure of the Whig government that the working classes in particular were dissatisfied with was the new poor law of 1834, um, which is rolled out across the country from 1834, but from 1837 onwards, particularly in the north of England. And there's huge discontent. And there's, again, think about tactics of protest movements, there's um, societies and associations set up to campaign against the new poor law and these are very grounded in working class districts in industrial districts that fear the new workhouses and the new punitive regime so the combination of these two measures um, passed by the Whig government um, begin to fuse in the later 1830s um, and end up um, creating a new movement called Chartism. Um, the discontent, the economic discontent that the working classes felt at their condition in industrial society and the new poor law um, began to be conceived of in political terms, that the only way they can get the franchise um, and sort out economic problems is to form what they called the People's Charter, and they campaigned uh, very famously, as we know, for six points, which are not brand new. Major Cartwright in the 1770s in the American Revolution was campaigning for these, but they get it's the first time these are really put down on paper and campaigned for as a platform. Um, so the six points are universal suffrage, so the vote for all men, no property qualifications for MPs, so that working class people can become MPs. Annual parliaments, so a general election each year. Equal representation, so reorganising the boroughs again so that um, there's an equal number of, of population per, per borough. Um, payment of, of MPs, so again um, encouraging working class people to give up their jobs to become MPs. And vote by ballot. So being able to vote in secret so that no one can coerce you to vote in a particular way. And it's a very clear platform, it's a very clear programme. And it's published in 1838 and 
one of the key tactics of the Chartists is to petition Parliament to get this passed. Um, the traditional historiography of Chartism focuses on the leaders, who, as you expect, are all male. Um, the most famous leader is Fergus O'Connor, an Irishman who runs the newspaper The Northern Star from Leeds, and he goes around the country campaigning. He's a um, very popular lecturer. He's a very fiery lecturer. Um, but there are other more moderate leaders like William Lovett, um, who is leading the campaign in Birmingham and in London, and there's James Brontair O'Brien, and all these um, characters that you'll come across. We're not going to focus on them um, individually in detail, um, partly because it's quite an old-fashioned way of looking at Chartism, although they are clearly important. You always need a leaders for a movement. And Chartism um, very much exploits the, the culture of personality, of celebrity. Um, they're very keen on having... Um, for example, people have portraits of these these people on the walls or in the pubs um, to remind people who the leaders are. Um, but it's quite a traditional way of looking at Chartism is to focus on leaders. Um, another of the tactics, as I've said, is petitioning. So the three main petitions that are presented to Parliament are in 1839, 1842 and 1848. And they are huge events. There's big processions. Um, to present them to Parliament. They're rejected three times by Parliament, um, but they do um, have a huge publicity and are signed by thousands and upon thousands of people. Chartism is a very organised movement. It's organised through branches who send delegates to a convention, um, who have executive committees. So it's a very 19th century way of organising a political movement. And it's successful. Um, thousands of people join the movement. You can pay um, a cheap subscription. And thousands upon thousands of, of people go to the big meetings that they organise to campaign for the vote. It is the most popular political movement in, in Britain. So even though it failed in getting these petitions passed by Parliament, it's still a successful movement in the number of people it attracts to it, both men, women and children. Um, so their tactics, in particular, they build on the heritage of the uh, mass platform that we saw that led up to Peterloo, and they have these huge monster meetings, as they call it, throughout the country, everywhere um, that has some open space. Um, we'll have speakers speaking on a platform, um, professing um, the cause of the People's Charter. And it's very much about democracy, it's very much about the people, it's very much about solving economic problems through political means. The biggest meeting that people know about, um, partly because it's one of the first meetings to be photographed, this photograph is Kennington Common in London, which comes at the culmination of a lot of agitation for the third petition. And as you can see there, that's um, a very typical portrayal of a, a Chartist meeting um, with the crowd surrounded the hustings in the middle and observers watching from the sidelines. And you get these posters all up um, across the walls encouraging people to um, attend. By 1848, um, remember it's another revolutionary year, so importantly there are other influences coming in to Chartism Notably, the um, Irish influence, the Irish are starting to campaign again um, for some level of independence. Um, and also the revolutionary European ideas are also um, influencing um, the demonstrations. I won't go on too much about this, but there's again an, an older historiographical question about how much of Chartism um, was motivated simply by poverty by people um, seeking a political solution to their economic condition. So there's a very famous quotation by one of the preachers of the movement, Joseph Rayner Stevens, when he says the question of universal suffrage is a knife and fork question. That is that um, if you get democracy, you'll be able to feed your family because you'll be able to change the economic situation in, in Parliament. And 
sometimes this is interpreted very simplistically that people just join the movement because they're poor um, but obviously historians will say it's not as simple as that um, so Malcolm Chase in his book says hunger does not readily translate into a sustained political movement supported by a dedicated press and its own professional agents and lecturers and for the most part distinguished by self-restraint and discipline this is exactly what chartism was it's a very professional if you like movement it's not just a, a simple reaction against hunger so there were other aspects of the chartist movement that they pursued which also showed that, that it had a much bigger political agenda and ideas coming into it so this is a plan of O'Connorville we're going to be looking at this in the workshop it's in Hertfordshire near Watford Rickmansworth area um, and the chartist land plan was a scheme set up by Fergus O'Connor and some other leaders to try and get the working class out of the industrial slums and working on the land and if you have land and property in Britain you have some sense of freedom and it's a very utopian scheme and um, very important they set up several other settlements and they did build houses and set up farms for um, people to migrate to it's done a lottery system so people would um, subscribe to the Chartist Land Company and if their lucky number came up they'd be given a plot um, in Hertfordshire and, and other places like Minster Lovell in Oxfordshire um, again it failed for various reasons but it's hugely significant in that they actually attempted this quite utopian scheme and that's a picture um, of Heron's Gate you can go and visit it um, this year the the Heritage Hub went and visit, had an organised visit to into some of the cottages which are still um, around. So if you live in the Rickmansworth Watford area, do go and check out um, the Chartist Village. Another key text in this um, historiography is Gareth Stedman Jones, um, who wrote um, quite a long time ago now um, a, a way of rethinking Chartism in which he debated the fact that the Chartists were a class-based movement and he looked at the language of Chartism and argued that it had much longer continuities with the parliamentary reform movements from the 1760s and 1770s onwards um, and that it was actually quite a traditional movement in what it was demanding and therefore it wasn't a reaction to the new industrial um, working class circumstances that's debatable and it depends on where you stand on um, how much continuity you think there was um, and we can debate that in the workshop but it's a very important um, historical argument um, so our debate will be chartism did not succeed because the movement had too many aims and tactics so you should have a look at all the different tactics that the charters um, used and also their aims that it wasn't just about the six points of the charter but it included other aspects um, including the land plan and many other ways of getting people involved and we'll also be looking at the more newer historiography which emphasizes the role of ordinary people not just the chartist leaders but but ordinary families and children in the movement in much more of a kind of social holistic way of looking at how a political movement operates in this period